David Bohm Seminar Series 2, Saturday morning, December 2nd, 1989, 11 o'clock session, Oak Grove School, Ojai, California. Yes. Well, we've begun to discuss something of the nature of thought, how it operates and so on. Uh, we might consider one or two more questions before we go on further into that topic. Fair to say that the number of different languages spoken in the world is a reflection of the incoherence? Well, not necessarily. I mean, it, it does, as long as people can understand each other. You know, it, it makes a problem in understanding, right? There are so many languages, uh, uh, they can be translated to a large extent. But uh, the incoherence comes deeper than that. You see, it comes because thought does not know what it is doing, it does something and then says it didn't do it, right? And then it tries to change it while it keeps on doing it. You see, that, that is a conflict. Right? <laughs> you see, that, that is the basic incoherence. We'll come to it further. It becomes especially serious when we <clears throat> have the thought about the self. Hmm? It's very serious also in the thought about society. <laughs> is, is thought grounded in opinions? Well, but opinions no ground. You see, the, the opinion is basically an assumption and thought based on a lot of assumptions, obviously, but it's, usually it's an assumption that people defend, right? Because they identify with it. And they, ought, they shouldn't, but they do. You see, a, a, a doctor may have an opinion and he may seek a second opinion. He means that he's made a certain assumption about the cause of the trouble and he's not sure about it. He'd like another doctor who may have another assumption. Now, but usually when people have opinions, they're not doing it that way. They're saying, you know, I, I'd like to hear your opinion because I'm not sure of my own. <laughs> usually they're ex when they exchange opinions, they're trying to defend them. Right? Like, you know, most, right? Hmm? And that, that's because they're identified with their assumptions. As, so they're defending it as if they're defending themselves. Hmm? Now, uh, thought is based on assumptions. That's something we, we could add that thought must work through assumptions. The assumptions should be open to question, you see, if necessary. <laughs> so when there's evidence, either from the senses or from sensitivity, that the assumptions are limited, or, then we have to question them. But if you're identified with them, you won't. You see, you may have the assumption, you know, that your religion is right, you see. <laughs> now, people defend that assumption. They defend that opinion, not say, well, I, I would like to have a second opinion about religion, you see. <laughs> they don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but that would be the right way to go about it, right? Again, I use the word right in a, <laughs> in a, in a very metaphoric sense, right? <laughs> uh, opinions are a type of thought. Yeah, they're, they're a part of thought. Uh, they are assumptions which very often people defend, right? against evidence that they're wrong. <coughs> meanings determine assumptions? What? Do meanings determine assumptions? Well, they work together. I mean, assumption affects the meaning, right? I mean, what makes you assume something? You know? no, it, it depends on everything. You say, well, okay, I'll assume this. Now, that's necessary for practical purposes to assume all sorts of things. Like we just said, we assume the floor will support us and so on. Hmm. But if we defended that assumption when it wasn't supporting us, then that would be uh, incoherent, right? Hmm. That becomes a belief, doesn't it? Mm. Yes, yeah, so usually you defend your beliefs. You see, a belief is a very strongly held opinion. Right? You know, the word belief has the, same, has the root leaf, an Anglo-Saxon root meaning love, you see. So what is believed is beloved. Right? <laughs> the opinion is defended by right? I may have, mis I may have uh, not heard the answer to this next question because I came a little late, but when you mentioned that uh, violence originates in thought, uh, what about uh, early man, in, uh, say in, in line with Darwinian evolution of uh, the, uh, the aggressiveness in, in, our, in the earliest evolution? Yeah, well, there's a lot of controversy about how aggressive people were, you see. <laughs> there's not, you know, uh, the... Uh, 
First of all, there's a, there has been a tendency to exaggerate that in a great deal of our culture, saying that because we are pretty aggressive, they must have been more so because civilization makes us better. You see? <laughs> but it may be the other way around. <laughs> you see, now, for example, some anthropologists or other such people are saying you don't find a lot of bones broken in the way which would suggest aggression. <laughs> you see, the old, very old bones. <laughs> so... Uh, also, there were small groups, and when there weren't too many of them, then the aggression may have been much less. Uh, so uh, the aggression tends to increase with increase of population, with pressure against each other, and with organization of society, one society against another. And so uh, uh, you see, uh, and that, that is thought. You see, 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 there may be some aggression there naturally, but thought tremendously builds it up. No, I, because it shows reasons why it is right to use force, you see. <clears throat> uh, the aggression of a, the society also creates a certain kind of thought. It keeps going yeah. round and round. Yeah, it goes back and forth, you see. But the, the aggression... Uh, see, aggression is a form of violence, right? Uh, it's an attempt by force to get what you want, right? Uh, in a situation where force is not called for. Aggression is well an expression of intense fear. It could be fear, but violence can come out of fear. It can come out of uh, greed. It could come out of uh, uh, all sorts of things. Right? The belief in your, the importance of believing in your God, which has some kind of fear behind it. You see, but it's all tied up with thought. You see, uh, that's one point that thought maintains all these things. You see, I'll just give an example. We'll come back to it later. Let's take anger, which gives rise to aggression and violence. Right? Hmm. Now, uh, there may be a spontaneous burst of anger, but uh, say with young children, it goes fast unless there's thought. You see, uh, suppose, for example, you've been waiting several hours for somebody. Uh, you had an appointment. You get very angry, right? Uh, you say, how, how, why is he doing this to me? What right has he got? You know, what, what does he mean by doing this? And so on and so on. And, uh, the more you, you think, the more angrier you get. But he comes and says, you know, uh, the train was delayed, and your anger goes, right? <laughs> if you believe him. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it shows that thought is, uh, plays a key part in sustaining anger, violence, and aggression. You see, as long as you think the train was delayed, you have no reason to be angry with him, right? <laughs> Uh, he did his best, you see. He, he, he treated you right. right? He, wasn't, he didn't just ignore you and said he had something better to do and he got here late. <laughs> but, uh, you see, if, if, but if you begin to think about it later and saying, you know, it's simmered down, but you know, what does he mean by delaying? He never treats me or he never pays any attention to me. He's always doing that. You know, he's always you know, putting himself first you know, and not regarding me as important and so on and so on. Then you build up the anger, huh? So you can see thought builds up anger, and it builds up aggression. The thought that I have been badly treated, he doesn't, and I, a force is called for to, for revenge, you see. Hmm? That will create violence, huh? The thought that he was violent to me, and there's a thought saying that I return violence for friendship for friendship and violence for violence, a common thought, right? So if I feel I've been treated violently, I will say that's a good reason for me to be violent. Hmm? So that thought creates violence huh? or aggression. Hmm? Or else saying, no, he's got something that I want, so let me go in there and take it, right? That's aggression. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and if you, if you do something different, which is to say, uh, they give me violence, but I give back friendship, you haven't necessarily broken the, no. the system because you you've still reacted, in a sense, internally. To That's right. You haven't seen violence. through violence, you see. So we have to get to that. Perhaps we'll come to that later. But you have to be free of this tacit process, this concrete reality of the process of violence, not this abstractions we're talking about. Right? You know, That's at the level of abstraction, saying, he gave me violence and I'll give him friendship. But these are all abstractions. Right? They're not getting at the concrete reality of that violence process. If we have a, a, a large hurricane and hundreds of people die, it's a very different reaction than if someone comes and hundreds of people oh, are yeah. Oh, yeah. But 
that, that interests me because is it because there is an intent? Uh, I mean, someone said, well, the structure of nature is not violent. In fact, the result is the same. People died, but something else happens. Yeah, it's not by intention. You see, and it's not. You see, if somebody treats you badly, you say, he's ignored me. He hasn't uh, paid any attention to me. He's uh, uh, rejected me. You see, there are all sorts of thoughts which build up violence, right? Well, why, why don't we do that to the hurricane? Why don't well, we if we believe that the God, if we believe the hurricane was due to gods, we would do it. You see, we would say, these gods, we worship them, we sacrifice to them, we did everything for them. Look the way they treat us. <laughs> you see, in fact, there are some peoples who do treat their gods that way, that if their gods won't produce the right results, they change them, you see. <laughs> Natural destruction, there's probably, well, it seems in my brain at least, this feeling that's probably come from the very beginning of having a brain that things like that happen. And so there isn't that incoherence. When a volcano blows up, I can't say, well, gee, why is this terrible thing happening? It's been happening since there was a brain. No, but you see, there are people who are religious and have said, I believe in God, I've done, been good all my life, you sit, and I've done all the right things, and look what happened to me. Right? <laughs> they, they feel God is. It's forsaken them, right? That's incoherent. Yeah. But then they can get a bit uh, angry about it, right? When a bunch of people come rushing in and kill a whole village of people, it always seems to strike you as something sort of bizarre well, I, if you're not involved in the politics of it, I guess. We must go in. So that there must be, I'm saying there must be the natural disasters sort of don't cause this. The, the same as the train, you see. If you see a, a valid reason for. Uh, the delay that you don't get angry, right? You see, if you say, well, my, the reason why this hurricane came is some force beyond anything which I can, anybody does anything about, there's no point in being angry about it. Right? But if somebody did it, then I could say, well, I'm going to get angry. Hmm? But people do get angry about hurricanes if someone close in their family dies. Well, that's because they're personalizing it tacitly, you see. Or if you get an illness, you know, there's always an anger. Why did I get this illness? Well, but that's part of the residue of the early background where people said, that, you know, this was the gods who sent this, right? Mm -hmm. And by that sort of thought, very often we have many levels of thought working. You know, old kinds of thought are still working while the new ones are put on top, right? In an odd way, getting angry at other people for what they've done is as ridiculous as getting angry at the storm. Well, that's just the point we want to come to. You see that uh, if you can see that, then you really see it in the process, in the concrete process, then that's it, right? <laughs> sort of the anger we feel at other people because their actions uh, hurt us is, is a process of ascribing motives to them. The, the person may just be congenitally unable to be punctual because uh, not because they, they mean something yeah. unkind or because they're attempting to be um, inconsiderate or yeah, dismiss well, you. you. But you say that, that so-and-so, look what he's doing to me. Yes. And, and, and we're ascribing these ill motives that really don't exist in the person. But he may world. even have them. You see, this, this is the key point, that some people are really inconsiderate and say, uh, I, I don't care about other people. I'll get there when I feel like, you see. Now, but if you get angry at that, that is just as foolish as getting angry at the fellow who is congenitally unable to be punctual. You see, if you know that fellow is unable to be punctual, you say, okay, that's not important. I know that fellow cannot be punctual. It doesn't bother me. But here's a fellow I know could be punctual, but he isn't. <laughs> see, what, what does that mean, right? <laughs> see, I'm trying to say the way you think determines it all. There was Shakespeare. How does it say? Uh, somebody quoted that. Thinking makes it so. There was something that came before. Nothing what? Bad. Nothing, Nothing good, good or bad, bad but thinking, thinking makes it so, right? <laughs> you were mentioning the fact that is there a parallel to watching television and watching violence on television and that we would not respond to that violence unless it was imprinting of violence? We yes, well, we must understand what violence is. But even if we had never seen violence, the mere structure of thought, which is implied by the program, will create violence in us, right? You see, it's implicit. Uh, that what's going on, you you pick it up with uh, the way that these people are thinking and feeling and so on. <clears throat> and therefore, uh, if you watch that stuff a while, you can build up uh, violence programs. <laughs> There's a con the converse of that also, the, these groups that, that want to change the face of television because there's too much violence and 
television. Is that a response? Well, to yes, well, it would help. Uh, you know, the, this violence does build up the violence programs, but it doesn't get to the root. Of, it's still superficial. You see, it won't really solve the problem. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, so uh, uh, the point then is that uh, uh, that thinking makes it so, right? <laughs> you see that if you think that there's a good reason for it, you won't get violent, you won't get angry, you know, no matter how bad it is, right? <laughs> it, I wonder whether um, you can not have violence arise. I would imagine that if you understood how the thought process works, actually the body may have a violent reaction, like watching television. I don't know if I could not have a violent response in my body, but I would not be caught by it. I would yeah. not act from it, or, or my further thoughts would not be perpetuated by that violence. <clears throat> but this, I would still have a reaction. Yeah, but you would see it has no meaning. You see, yeah. now the point is when you don't see that, you take it to heart, and you say it has a lot of meaning, yeah. and it, it affects you, you see. So the... I'm just wondering whether, I, I don't think we're going to stop violence in, in reactions to things, no, per we, se. Well, I think it would be wrong to try to stop violence, you see. That would be another form of violence, you see. that uh, the, What we have to do is to perceive the meaning of violence as it comes, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, to see that it's the undue use of force. Now, when you, you may react with an undue force, but then you see it and see that it is not a proper use of force, and therefore it goes, right? See, the same as to say, uh, I thought this fellow was, see, I'm not saying this is the right way, but this fellow says, I thought that he was just ignoring me, but I see that the train was late, right? So the, I had all sorts of violence in me, and then it goes. Now, that's not the answer, but I'm saying it shows that the way you think about it is crucial. Yeah, I, I'm just suggesting that in what you are suggesting, it doesn't imply, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not making yeah. a statement, I'm, it's a question that's yeah. coming out as a statement, that it implies that by doing this, violence will the um, impulse of violence will disappear. A and I'm just wondering if the response in the organism may still occur, but there will, even if I've seen the process. Yes, well, there may be a tendency in the organism to resort to force too easily, if you want to put it that way, maybe due to the whole past uh, history, but then we, we see it. You see, we're not trying to get rid of violence yes, yeah. or do anything. You see, what we're trying, what we want is to learn the whole process. That's crucial, right? Yeah. Now, as a byproduct of that, probably it will go down. But if we do it for the purpose of getting rid of it, we are still doing the same thing we want to get rid of. <laughs> Isn't that happening um, in the process of even talking about it? It seems like hmm, somebody says, well, I've been praying to God forever and nothing's happening, so now I'm going to get rid of that. That doesn't work. I'll try something else. Yeah. And in sitting here, I mean, even sometimes I feel like there's part of me that stops following along because it's there's a threat to the organism or some kind of blockage or tuning out that that won't <coughs> keep in, stay with the process of the, the thought here. Hmm. Yes, well, what is this block? I mean, what is the threat? Perhaps the threat is actually that, from what you're saying, when I hear you saying, the threat may be that we actually do create our own reality by thinking. And that may be threatening to us, to something in us, is, oh my God, I'm really responsible for what's out there. Well, there's a threat of that kind, and there may be a threat that the whole structure that we've created is liable to collapse, right? Well, I'll lose myself or something. Yeah. There may be various fears arising of that nature, you see. So we have to say, well, okay, that's part of the whole process, right? Mm -hmm. hmm? Well, I'd like to pay more attention to that process because I kind of feel it and I, I need to go slower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the sensitivity you were talking about yesterday, that doesn't just happen because you suggest, well, we need to be sensitive. I mean, I'm not sensitive. So well, yeah. I can't always get, I mean, sometimes I just need to stop okay, in this process. But, so what is the next, can you say something about it? I think that what I'm feeling is, 
wanting to have an answer for there's there's a problem here and it's in thinking it's in thought and I'm getting nervous yeah well you're anxious nervous right uh, and uh, oh, no that means you s sense some danger right hmm? now what could be the danger Well, if there's something maybe unfamiliar, I don't know. Yeah, but you feel that it's dangerous. It also has a sense of excitement to it, so it kind of goes back and forth. Is that tacit knowledge? What? To, to whatever are your senses of, of something, projections of something that's unfamiliar to you, and then you give it the sign of danger or... Well, that could be part of tacit knowledge. You see, we have tacit knowledge of how to project felts, past feelings of fear and uh, anxiety and danger. You know, we don't quite see how we're doing it, right? Hmm. But we learn that as well as learning things that are useful. Hmm. Then there's a self-image implicit in all this, being that is vulnerable. That's what's vulnerable, what can be hurt by this man that ignores us or Yes, uh, there's the self-image, and we have to come to wh why that is so Im seems to be so important, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there are various things that it seems could be hurt. You see, we might discuss hurt, right? Now, of course, you hurt your body and you feel pain, but that isn't the kind we're talking about, because usually you, you can make a rational response to that, right? Uh, one way or another. <laughs> but uh, the... Uh, Somebody says something or does something or you know ignores you or whatever, and you, you feel hurt, right? Mm -hmm. Now, just as you project another person's your own violence into another person, you see where does the pain come from that you feel, right? It must come from you. Right? See, there's memory of pain, right? Now, somehow a thought li releases that memory of pain. Huh? Is that clear? We don't see it happening, but it does. You see, that's one of the troubles. It's too fast. Hmm? Now, then when it comes, you say, I have been hurt, and then comes automatically the uh, notion, I must protect myself against that, right? Hmm. I, I shouldn't be hurt again, right? If it, uh, in the case of physical hurt, that's a reasonable uh, conclusion, right? But, in the, but if you're hurting yourself, it, it's, there's something wrong with that, you see. You see, you're saying, I am violently hitting myself in some way and saying, I've got to protect myself from that by keeping away from any situation that might do it, right? But I might be keeping away from things that are very important to me. Hmm? I think that's also the case, that uh, you stop before you've had a chance to uh, see the whole situation. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it just falls away. It, it just isn't there anymore. Yeah, but you see, before that happens, the whole train of thought starts, which you know, uh, justifies it yeah. and makes it so, right? <laughs> uh, but I think we have to stay with that. Yes, now that's difficult because the whole, whenever there is something painful, the whole movement of instinct is to do anything to really, really reduce the pain. Now that, that makes sense physically, right? Hmm. Yeah, but it doesn't make sense if you're interested in this particular thing. Yeah, but it doesn't make sense here because if you are producing the pain, then you're tangling yourself up by moving in such a way as to get rid of what you are. You produce it on the one side and try to move to get rid of it on the other by involving a lot of other things, you know, which are wrong, you know, which you don't want to do, right? You might say, I won't ever go into that relationship, side of relationship again, but maybe that would block you, right? I think it definitely would. Yeah. And therefore, you're hindering yourself in all sorts of ways to avoid this hurt which you are producing yourself. Yes. You know, it would make more sense to say, let me stop hitting myself, <laughs> if you could, right? <laughs> Hmm? Well, that's one of the keys that makes us not be free, is, is, is trying to hide from these 
the Lord these hurts. Mm -hmm. And therefore we don't do things. Yeah, we avoid all kinds of things that we really want to do. But if I follow you, I don't understand why the rejection of emotional hurt is less valid than the rejection of physical pain, or at least the recognition and, and, and an attempt to ameliorate it is less valid emotionally, unless you're absolutely disregarding the idea of ego and original yeah. hurt and rejection. Yeah, well, I'm saying that that's all part of the program, and which doesn't make sense. If we, if we can't get past that, then I don't think we're going to ever get it straight. You see, uh, that, that program means that we are controlling our thoughts by trying to satisfy the demands of the program at all costs, no matter how irrational our behavior is. What do you put in its place? Well, nothing. We have, we have to end that thing, you see. And what, what will come in its place will be the natural uh, sensitivity and intelligence. You see, this is one of the things that blocks the natural sensitivity and intelligence. See, if your intelligence would say, okay, I've been hurt this time, but maybe, you know, there's no reason why I should be hurt next time. You know, they're, they're all different people. They're not my father and mother anymore. <laughs> your intelligence might tell you that, but the program just insists that it's the same as before. It's the intelligence that has built up that particular program. No, it's the unintelligence. You see, it's the automatic response. You see, it's insensitivity and violence and so on. You see, let's take a child who has been hurt, right, by parents or friends or whatever. Now, he doesn't understand what's going on, you see, but they have done something which he doesn't understand. And uh, he has got into this business of feeling pain about it. And it's so painful that he doesn't want to feel it anymore. He may f try to forget it altogether, but it's still there. Now, that's unconsciously affecting everything he does, making it, uh, you know, wrong, <laughs> whatever that means, but making it incoherent. Hmm? Now, as long as that little nucleus and program is there, he's dominated by that, you see. So the point is, could we get free of that program? You see, see if you had such a program on a computer, you would say, let's get it out. <laughs> You see, if you have a virus on a computer which keeps on saying, let's reproduce all sorts of silly stuff, you say, well, we've got to get free of that, right? Now, here we have a kind of a virus on the program which, makes also, which says this is, uh, this is first priority stuff. Everything else must take second priority, no matter how irrational it is. Now, if we could somehow remove that, I don't say how or anything at this moment, <laughs> then the, the, there would be no problem, you see. Buddhist ideal annihilation of ego? Uh, it doesn't mean that we're going to annihilate the ego. You see, I'm trying to say that maybe it will, maybe it won't. But there is a program which contains all sorts of irrational features. Now, if you say the ego is so valuable that no matter how irrational it is, we've got to keep it going, then that's one approach. Now, I think everything else must adjust to that. Now, that means the end of the human race, as we can see. Now, the, uh, the, uh, the Buddhists have explored the idea that the ego has no ground. You see, it's not that we annihilate, but we should acknowledge that there is no ground to the ego. It, it actually is just a bunch of programs interacting. <laughs> That's what, essentially what they're saying. They're saying it's conditioned. All things mutually condition each other, uh, and they're coming into being. And therefore, uh, whatever it is there is not that important, you see. Uh, now, that doesn't mean you get rid of everything, but uh, uh, because you will still have some sense of ego probably, but it's a question of the degree of importance that's given. You see, if the ego has first priority over everything, this is going to wreck, uh, wreck the whole uh, system. What is important then? That's the crucial point. Yeah, well, we're going to have to say, we can't state exactly what is important, but we can state what is not, you see. We're saying that programs are not important. They're not, that there are other things that are more. Life is more important than program. That is one thing I would put. But people believe the other way around. You say, when your nation says fight, they say, you've got to fight and get killed. You've got to have the nuclear bombs drop on you, if that's what they say, right? They say nation is more important than life, right? But if nation is a program, it can't be so. <coughs> if religion is a program, it couldn't be so. But people have died, have said, let's destroy vast areas for religion, you see, vast numbers of people. Do you perceive that Tibetan approach that was suggested here as a program that would, in a sense, get in the way of watching the process? I, I didn't hear the first part. The Tibetan, uh, the, 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 the notion, of the, the intellectual notion of the annihilation of the ego. Well, I don't like the use of the word, you see. Maybe what they're doing is right, for all I know, you see, but... Uh, uh, it's a program, isn't it? Yeah. 
if you say annihilate, it has a kind of a connotation of violence, which it disturbs me. And I, I feel it's not quite uh, the way we should go. But uh, if we say that we are going to be sensitive to this ego and uh, see what it, how it really works, so that perhaps some of the programs will go, right? That's what I was asking. You're saying be sensitive to the process as opposed to a definition of the process, uh, which is what uh, annihilation of the ego is an attempt. Yeah, but I don't know for sure what the annihilation would mean, you see. It's an attempt to define the process. Yeah. You know, and you're suggesting, uh, I don't know how many... Well, but I'm suggesting, let's begin... I'm not trying to go that far immediately. I'm saying that I think we can go through a series of stages and look at it and say, at this stage, you see, we can see that the ego has these various programs in it. It may have some useful features too. And we don't make up our minds about it, right? Hmm? And uh, uh, see, people have to remember who they are and where they belong and things like that. There are a lot of things which, if we annihilate the ego altogether, I don't think we could survive, you see. Now, but there are a lot of things that have accumulated inside that ego, giving it tremendous importance, which gets in the way of everything else. And they're all thoughts, huh? Um, ego itself is a creation of Western psychology. It's a thought in itself. The Buddhists would say that ego is an illusion, So, and they're certainly not saying that you go around annihilating illusions. Yeah. Um, and so in some sense, what I hear happening here now is that there's a defending of a thought called ego. Yeah, or me, or anything, right? Yeah. Let's call it me, right? Or us, against them, right? Well, there is some tacit thought that everybody keeps referring back to and saying they can't understand what all this means in relationship to the thought they haven't understood yet. <laughs> well, you know yeah. what I mean? I mean yeah, well, deep see, I think we're going to come to this question of what is the self and so on. You see, I'm not sure the word ego is the best word. It has been introduced <clears throat> in the, by late Western philosophy and psychology, but uh, the... Uh, uh, but there are simpler words like I, myself, and me, myself, and I, right? And you and us and them, right? That's the, that's the area we have to get into, right? Hmm? Uh, when we talk of ego, it begins to make an object of it, which is not a process, you see. Uh, if you talk of the ego process, well, okay, but then that's the very word ego tends to make you think otherwise. So uh, there's a kind of process which we have to get into, right? Now, uh, that has taken on tremendous importance so that you can think if it has not been treated properly, it's a very high priority affair (laughs) and uh, everything must take second place, right? Hmm. It has high value, you see, high priority. Uh, Now, uh, we have to get into that. Why should that be and what, you know, what is it that might change that and so on? Now, if we indeed want it to change, right? (laughs) Uh, we have to agree, you know, look into it. Do you want it to change? Well, not everybody may not, you see. <laughs> uh, so, uh, the, uh, 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 but uh, I think now that we, uh, we have about 15 more minutes, and I don't think it would be appropriate to begin now. But uh, let, let's say that we have uh, this question of hurt, you know, that we hurt ourselves. That's the thing to keep in mind. And we don't know exactly how or why we do it, but maybe we can get some insight into that. Hmm? If we weren't hurting ourselves, then we wouldn't have to get into all this unnecessary trouble about hurt, right? Uh, the, uh, uh, and <coughs> the, uh, the pain surely comes from yourself, from memory, you see. Uh, now, the physical pain may be a warning that something is wrong. You see, you have a toothache or your muscle hurts. Uh, something is wrong, you should attend to it, right? Now, if, you, if the analogy were right, you would say mental pain means something is wrong inside, I should attend to it. But I want to suggest that we, that's a wrong picture. That's not the correct picture. That's something that we are hurting ourselves. We are not seeing what's going on. You know, like children say, sticks and stones can hurt my bones, but names can never hurt me. But that's a correct perception of the truth, as it were, but they, they can't do it, right? <laughs> uh, uh, the uh, uh, and why not? You see, that's what we have to get into. Hmm? Uh, the uh, uh, so uh, now uh, I think we should say a little more about the nature of thought. You know, see, uh, before we go into all that, 
because it's all it's a question of thought that's doing it. You see, thought includes feelings, felts of various kinds, and muscular tensions, remember, and all that. Uh, that it all comes from the memory and the program, right? Uh, now, hmm? do you think that thought really wants to perpetuate its existence, and that's why it wants to keep releasing the memory of the psychological fur? Well, that may be partly behind it, but you see, why couldn't it perpetuate its existence without hurting itself? You see, why, why couldn't it just follow what these children rhyme says, that names could never hurt me, you see? Names are just words, why should they hurt me? <laughs> because we're always building up a positive self-image. Yes, but then I ask a question, why do, you ta why do people take images so seriously? An image is nothing, so why should we defend it, right? In fact, we would perpetuate ourselves more uh, readily if we didn't do this. That's so true. I mean, this is the, the thing which may destroy us altogether. Right. It's a kind of a curious uh, <coughs> point. You see, we're not... Self-protection. No, it, it, we think it's self-protection, but it's not. You see, we're confused about what's all going on. It, it, incoherent and confused, right? This is the basic point. Thought is incoherent and confused and does not know what it is doing, right? But if we figure out what is going on and get it straight, it doesn't make any difference. No, it, it makes some difference, but it won't stop. You see, uh, that's, uh, therefore we have to go into it, that there's more to it than just making a map of it. In thought, we can make a map of what's going on, which will be helpful. We have to then find the concrete reality of the territory, <laughs> which is that process that we can't put our hands on. Right? <clears throat> so it's the dictatorship of thought that we are trapped in. We are the dictatorship of thought suppressing the, uh, the natural uh, laws of our organism and our body. Well, we are all that, but we don't know why are we doing this crazy thing, you see. This, this thought, we say, okay, we are that, let's stop, right? <laughs> that would be the sensible thing. But then people find they can't stop, right? They say, they do not see... We do not see the whole results of thought. We, part of it we don't call, acknowledge to be thought. And also we've created such a, a tangle of things that are, uh, that on which our life seems to depend by now that we're afraid to question it, right? Hmm? <laughs> you see, see, for example, to stop grow, economic growth would involve such a change of millions of things that it's, you know, it would be a tremendous wrench. <laughs> In thought, yeah. If it weren't for thought, it might be very easy. <laughs> Even this, all this explanation seems very complicated and tangled. And I wonder if it might even be more understood if it were um, seen physically, graphically. And how would you do it? I don't know. I draw it on the board or something. But it's still another kind of thought. Uh, it's a more graphic thought. You see, what you draw on the board is still thought, right? Yes, but aren't we using thought to unravel this? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you're saying that you could see it better visually than by words. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe. I mean, I, I mean let's have a blackboard. <laughs> I mean, if we have a good artist here, we could... <laughs> What? Draw the yeah, that's right. Let's have a <laughs> uh, I mean, there could be visual aids to all this. I mean, that's an interesting thing to explore, right? I mean, very clearly, if you're in an airplane, you see no boundaries to countries. You fly over the borders, and uh, yet uh, the army will draft you, and you will go and get and offer yourself to be killed. That's right. And I also, you even have pictures of the whole Earth taken from the Moon. And, uh, it, I say, people say that's very impressive, but it doesn't change all these other things. You see, the enmity of the Arabs and the Jews and things like that. They all know about these pictures of, from the Moon. <coughs> uh, <coughs> now, <coughs> the, uh, uh, so uh, uh, there's something more involved, you see, which is how, how are we going to engage this reality, right? this concrete <laughs> reality of the process? The way the children are brought up right away, the parents, it's just... 
But that's how it comes. But you see, you can't, uh, uh, unless the older people change, that won't change, right? The children are not strong enough to change the parents, so <laughs> parents have got to change, right? Uh, <coughs> Yeah. What's your motive behind this have anything to do with it? Why? Let's say I sense that most of us have a motive for being here and that mm -hmm. is to be rid of unhappiness or desperation. Does that have anything Yeah, well, that may have. I mean, that's a natural motive, but we may find that it gets in the way, right? So that's what I mean. Does that get in our way? Does it can because we'll, we'll discuss that because that is more of the same kind of thought. You see, projecting a goal, a psychological goal, which when we don't understand what we're doing in the first place, you see. You see, it's another kind of violence. You see that we thought is producing this whole story and then it projects a goal of something better while it keeps the whole story going anyway. Right? You see, it doesn't make sense, right? You see. But no matter where we're situated in thought, <coughs> we're going to be situated in the wrong place, so we might as well start. Yeah, well, we, we've got, but, but it's also the right place because it's where the trouble is. <laughs> You know, it's not like the story of the fellow who was looking for the key where the light was. <laughs> not where he lost it, right? <laughs> uh, so you see, we lost it there in, in thought, so that's where we've got to find it. <laughs> uh, what, what, it what comes up for me is the, uh, when, when that is said, that it kind of discounts the idea that has come up through Western philosophy, um, the idea of contemplation, and then the Eastern uh, uh, ideas of meditation and, and literally stopping the thought process, stopping thinking, um, that perhaps it's a combination of both thinking and stopping thinking, yeah, not right. just thinking. Yeah. Yeah, we've got to think and got to see what thinking is, is right? Now it's some contemplation. Maybe, maybe we see what thinking is by stopping thinking. If you can. You see, uh, the, the point is, uh, there are two sides. You can look at it individually or collectively, right? We are thinking collectively and individually. Now, you could, as an individual, contemplate and stop thinking, up to a point anyway. I'm not sure how far it would go, but uh, the, uh, uh, you, you, you would find that as we start to talk together again, the same problems would arise, you see, that in the East, people still can't avoid the kind of problems that arise when they think, you see, when they have to talk together and so on. That they still get into all these problems, you see, that the East never solved that. Uh, the, the same sort of incoherence, uh, basically the life in the East is just about as incoherent as it is in the West. It's some difference in details. Uh, so I think that we really have to pay attention to thought, and paying attention to thought in, implies being beyond thought in some sense, right? While we are in thought and also beyond it, right? Do you see what I'm driving at then? Uh, now, attention goes beyond thought. As like awareness and attention, maybe we should just finish on this note that there are two things that anyway we could say go beyond thought besides sensitivity. Well, uh, sensitivity is basically generalized as awareness, right? Aware means to be watchful, wary. You know, it doesn't mean only to be conscious and think, right? So cognizant. So uh, the uh, uh, so the uh, there's awareness which inc includes thought and more than thought, and then there's attention, in which we uh, uh, bring this thing to a whole, as it were, and this attention surely goes beyond thought. It may have any number of forms, you see, which go beyond the program. When we see something new, we must pay attention in a new way, right? not just by the program. Now, very often people pay attention by the program. You see, if you know somebody very well and you pass that person in the street, you say, I saw him. <laughs> but if you ask what was he wearing, you probably don't know, right? You see, you, a few small points you recognize and said, that's him, right? So the, uh, 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 now, the attention was controlled by the program. But now attention could change in any number of ways. You know, when you see something new, you have to get out of the ordinary pattern of attention. Now, I think attention goes beyond thought. Uh, awareness, sensitivity go beyond thought. But we have, what I'm trying to say is we have to have that present when in, in connection with thought. Uh, because thought is where the problem is, you see. Where the, now, uh, 
the uh, uh, and, and I'm suggesting as an approach that we get into uh, the question of being aware of thought, paying attention to thought, but also forming thinking about thought, forming a map of thought. But then we some kind of attention. To, uh, the question is how we get beyond that map. You see. <laughs> Uh, acquiring something beyond thought as well, right? That really the division between thought and beyond thought is a, another one of those boundaries that thought produces. Uh, it might help if we realize that we always are beyond thought. And yeah. We be here. <laughs> well, that's, I'm trying to say thought itself is beyond thought because I said thought is this tacit process that you cannot uh, describe. That process you don't grasp in thought, right? <laughs> that when you are thinking, the actual process is beyond thought. <laughs> but the abstractions which it produces are what we call thought, right? If you talk like a computer, talk on computer, and we are, may, we, we may be able, we need to be able to use the computer to use it, but that to be trapped in the computer. Yes, that's true. And one of the assumptions which thought often makes is that thought covers everything and there's not, nothing else. You see, then it ha- helps to trap you. Now, uh, there is something beyond, but thought I, 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 does one of two things. Either it assumes there's nothing beyond, or it assumes that some of the things which it has produced are beyond, <laughs> right? In the imagination, right? <laughs> you see, these are the two difficulties you get into, right? Now, therefore, you need to be sensitive to see that there is something beyond thought and that, it, that uh, the fanciful imagination is not one of these things, you see. <laughs> uh, uh, the, but often it looks very real and beyond thought, right? Beyond thought, but not so made by. Not so. Not thought made by. Self-made. 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 I didn't get that. Not made by beyond thought. thought, but not the reality made by thought. Yes. Well, you see, thought makes, as we said, a certain reality which we can see all around us and inside of us, between us. And But what underlies that reality, even the reality that thought made, is beyond thought. Right? That is, it's a certain abstraction which makes us look at it as the way thought looks at it. Right? But we'll go into that later. You see, I'm trying to say that the underlying whatever it is, is beyond thought and it includes thought, right? That thought is part of that reality. Because if you said that thought is one thing and the reality is another (laughs) and put a boundary between them, then that would not be the whole of the reality, right? Is that clear? So we have to say that in some sense there is a whole which includes thought. Now that thought which we mean is the real concrete process of thought that we can't get hold of in our hands (laughs) or by thought, (laughs) to include the ineffable that we can't get hold of. Yes, that's right. The ineffable is just what you cannot name or think, right? Uh, Right, but uh, perhaps we'll leave it at that then. uh, We'll end on the ineffable. (laughs) 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 So that you can ponder, you can contemplate the ineffable (laughs) while you eat, right? (laughs) 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 We meet here at... uh, 3.30 for, you know, for tea and 4 o'clock to start, right?